Investors Chronicle. Hello and welcome back to the IC Interviews. I'm Mary McDougall and we have a particularly special guest today, the IC's very own Chris Dillow, our resident economist. Chris has been at the IC for 25 years and before that he was UK economist at Japanese bank Numura. Chris, thank you so much for giving up your time. How are you? Well, thank you and thank you for that kind introduction. So let's kick off talking about inflation, one of the big unknowns that could hurt investment portfolios. I know it's probably a bit unwise to sweat over monthly data too closely, but the US and UK have published their August figures this week. US eased a little bit, but it's still over 5%. UK CPI this morning has come in a little ahead of expectations at 3.2%. Inflation in Germany is around 4%. So the important question, I think, is whether or not inflation is transitory or if it's built to last. I think you're of the former opinion, but lots of people are less sure. Please, can you spell out your position on this? Yeah, I'm in the transitory camp. And one reason for that is that what we're seeing now is partly not so much prices taking off as prices returning to normal. Um, So, for example, in today's data, One reason why inflation rose is that the cut in restaurant prices last August caused by the eat out to hope out scheme and the cut in VAT um, simply dropped out of the annual inflation rate. And uh, and that added about 0.4 percentage points to CPI. Another issue is that petrol prices were unusually low last summer. Uh, because of the of the world recession, uh, and now they are nearer to normal, and petrol prices are up by almost eighteen percent year on year. That's added another zero point four percent to CPI. But in, if you look at the level of petrol prices, they're actually lower than they were between twenty eleven and twenty thirteen. So the story there is one of how unusually low prices were last year rather than how unusually quickly they're rising now. And if you take out those two uh, effects from the CPI, you've got inflation of around 2.4% now, which is is no no big issue. Another issue we have with inflation, which often occurs in the early phases of a recovery from recession, is that there's a mismatch between the pattern of supply and the pattern of demand such that there's talk about shortages of lorry drivers, of care workers, of hospitality workers. But if you look at the aggregate labour market data, unemployment is still a little higher than it was before the pandemic. So the story isn't one of generalised labour shortages. It's a, a mismatch between where the unemployed workers are, you know, their particular skills, and the skills that employers need. And we know that over time, those mismatches um, get get corrected uh, as people move and train uh, for, for, for the jobs where there are vacancies. Yeah, it, it takes time, but eventually it happens. Yeah, that's very interesting. Am, am I right in thinking that it is the wage demands and maybe inflation expectations that are the factors that are likely to determine the prolonged inflation? Yes, uh, in, in short. a big factor traditionally on inflation has been if unemployment falls very far. But that's not the case at the moment. If you add together the official unemployment figures, which are slightly higher than they were at the pre-pandemic peak, to the number of people who who would like a job but are not in the labour market, you've got 3.3 million people there, according to the latest figures which is roughly the same as before the pandemic. So it's not the case that the labour market is especially tight. If you look at total number of hours worked, they're they're still more than 4% below pre-pandemic levels. There's 3 million people working fewer hours than they'd like. All of that tells us that the labour market in aggregate is not so tight as to be causing generalised wage inflation. And if you look at actual wage inflation data everybody's talking about the annual wage growth but as with price inflation that tells us that wages were unusually low last summer because people were working fewer hours if you look at 
what's happened to wages so far this year, in the private sector, they've only risen 1.6%, which is an annualised rate of under 3%. You know, that is not inflation. And in fact, real wages so far this year have actually fallen, you know, because wages have risen less than consumer prices. You know, in aggregate, the labour market is not tight. How does the UK compare with the US? Because I saw a chart this morning from M&G, which shows that the number of unemployed people is lower than the number of job openings, and that this is the first time this has happened. So would you say that maybe it's tighter in the US than it is the UK? Or No. Um, what we're seeing in the US is perhaps even to a greater extent than the UK, a mismatch between where there's vacancies, where, where there are people have to work. If you look at the ratio of employment to population in the US, um, which captures the fact that there are people who are unemployed who would like a job who, but who aren't in the labour market and aren't counted as unemployed, that ratio is, is really rather low. It's a good couple of percentage points below its pre-pandemic level, which itself wasn't as extraordinarily high. You know, so so e e even in the US, you've got pockets of labour market slackness coexisting alongside pockets of shortages, which is a sign of a, a mismatch. And what are your thoughts on commodities prices? Some people talk of a new commodities super cycle. We've seen certain commodities, things like timber, go up a lot. How does this feed into the inflation story? Well, I, I, again, this is, this is partly um, the result of the sharp snapback we've seen in, in economic activity. One thing I like to look at for general commodity prices is the Chinese money stock. Now, in recent years, commodity prices have been very sensitive to Chinese economic activity. And a lead indicator of China's economic activity is the M1 measure of the money stock there. And this has been really rather disappointing in, in, in recent months. You know, it is not predicting the sort of surge in Chinese economic activity that leads to significant commodity price inflation. You know, so, so again, I, I, I would be cautious about commodity prices. There's no reason to suppose they're going, they're going to slump. But the, the best lead indicators we have of them uh, don't point to great inflation either. There are different ways to measure inflation. I find it quite confusing on what you should really follow. I think central banks have been accused of twiddling how they presented a bit in the past. Earlier this year, I read that the Bureau of Labour Statistics has started reporting CPI less food, shelter, energy and used cars and trucks, which seems a convenient way to show a number lower than the headline. Do you have any recommendations on what people should look at to really understand what's actually happening? Yes, there are, there are two things to look at here. One is just plain, in, in the UK, plain CPI inflation, right? Because that is what the Bank of England is supposed to target, right? The Bank of England's target is for CPI inflation to be around 2%. Now, it's, now, it is allowed to tolerate deviations from that in exceptional circumstances. And I think now is, is one such exceptional circumstances. But CPI is the target, and that is what matters. Now, there is a variation on that that you can look at, which is trimmed mean CPI inflation. And the National Institute for Economic and Social Research publishes this occasionally, which is basically CPI inflation excluding the biggest risers and fallers in the inflation rate. Uh, and the, the point of that is that there are occasions when inflation can be pushed up by some extreme price movements for one or two sectors or pushed down by extreme falls in one or two sectors. And the trimmed mean looks at what's happening to most prices rather, rather than all. Um, and so, so the trim mean would exclude at the moment things like petrol and, and restaurant meals, which, which have shot up. But, but um, I, I, generally, I would say av avoid the nonsense and just look at CPI. Great. Do you think it's right that housing's excluded from CPI? This is a tricky one because um, 
it's it is very hard to actually get a measure of of housing costs that that, that suits everyone you know if if you're a renter your housing costs are very different from if you're an owner occupier and if you're an owner occupier with a big mortgage your housing costs are different from someone who's paid off the mortgage and all these complications mean that the statisticians have responded simply by wanting to exclude most housing costs which which i think is reasonable we've got lots of measures of house price inflation which you know which, which we can look at but they are separate stories i think from general cpi inflation you don't need one big aggregate measure of everything and i think we should be careful as economists in looking at aggregate data because there was a long tradition of scepticism about how much this can actually tell us we'll come back to housing later but if you're right and inflation normalizes then what happens so does that mean there wouldn't need to they wouldn't need to start tapering qe interest rates can be kept low it, it means i think there's no rush to taper qe or to or to raise interest rates the danger of unemployment staying high of the private sector relapsing back into weak growth is sufficiently high at the moment relative to the danger of inflation accelerating that I think I think central banks are, are right to want to err on the side of delaying. Is there if low interest rates stay lot stay very low for a long time what are the risks here I think it, it makes banking less profitable is there a chance it could result in banks lending less not more even though low rates are designed to uh, designed to encourage borrowing well there's, there's not really any evidence of that at the moment i think the main thing that's um stopping bank lending accelerated is on the demand side you know companies are reluctant to borrow because they they're reluctant to expand they don't see uh, profitable investment opportunities out there you know and they are still very cautious about about the future because you know covid is still very much with us you know, and that that still poses the threat of depressing demand no i know covid is very much still with us maybe that also feeds into the argument that it's suppressing inflation <laughs> because you know at the start of the pandemic the worry was deflation and then after all the stimulus the worry was inflation and do you think that might be a fair point it, it could be yeah i mean if you look at retail sales official figures show that these fell from april to july the idea that the money that we'd saved during the lockdown would, would lead to a spending splurge seems not to have happened and there's lots of possible reasons for that but one is, is still that people are worried about going to the shops going to pubs and restaurants to the extent that they used to. You said earlier that there's no rush to increase interest rates, but the implication there is that it will have to happen at some point. Debt globally is at record peacetime levels and interest rates are at record low levels. As interest rates start to rise, do you think this could be a problem? You could get into a vicious circle if interest payments are then paid by borrowing more no from the point of view of um government borrowing the circumstances in which interest rates rise are circumstances in which the economy will be stronger and in which tax revenues will therefore be greater so so that for, from the point of view of, of the government you know the a world of rising interest rates is is not a problem for the public finances for the corporate sector, if you'd asked me this 18 months ago, I'd have pointed out that it's not much of a problem for the corporate sector in our, on average, because ever since the financial crisis, companies have been building up cash balances. Now, the problem is that um, during the pandemic, we saw something very different happen there. We, although larger companies have continued to, to build up cash, there's an awful lot of smaller firms that are very much more heavily indebted 
uh, and a rise in interest rates could could be catastrophic for them. You know, so you could well see lots of smaller business closures at the same time as larger firms are, are able to withstand it. Yeah, Russell Napier, author of the Solid Ground newsletter, who I think is, has a different stance from you, argues that governments can't afford to let interest rates rise materially and um, may have to resort to financial repression, which he says implies exchange controls, which means restrictions on overseas investment to have the effect of keeping rates down, um, something that existed pre-Thatcher feels very radical, but I would be interested to hear what your response to that, that thinking is. Well, I think the reason why we don't want to see interest rates rise very much is that the economy is too fragile to, to cope with the sort of real interest rates which we had in the 80s and 90s. So in that sense, he's right. But as for whether financial repression is is needed. I, I I don't I don't see that. You know, I, I, I don't see that there is a, there is a problem financing government borrowing. In fact, quite the opposite. You know, in our world of secular stagnation, there is huge demand for safe assets. You know, people want to buy treasuries and 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 gilts, you know, especially from overseas. And and it's that that's keeping interest rates low. Not so much the the trickery uh, of governments. You know, people forget that monetary policy is is endogenous. It's um, a, a response to to the state uh, of the economy. And the reason why we've got QE is that the economy is is structurally very weak in in the, in the Western world. Yeah, I guess the difference is he's probably more worried about inflation. Um, but let's move on to. Asset prices. So, as you said, or said earlier, that QE and low interest rates have had the effect of inflating house prices and equities, real assets, but notably equities. Do you worry about the distributional consequences of these policies? Well, no, really, because it is the cat. I mean, obviously, rich people get richer when asset prices go up. That 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 that's trivial, but. The effect of quantitative easing and low interest rates and loose fiscal policy has been to keep people in work. Yeah. And that's that's much, much better than than um, a, a, a world in which QE uh, hadn't hadn't occurred. You know, and if you are worried about the distributional effects of monetary policy, then the solution is, is, is in the tax system. It's not in monetary policy. You know, central bankers should target inflation and target economic stability. They shouldn't worry about inequality. That's that's other people's job. What do you think of the the government's response to the to the crisis in terms of fiscal policy? In term in terms of macro fiscal policy, they got it right. In terms of the details, I'm I'm not so sure. I mean, in retrospect, he, eat out to help out was a terrible idea because it led to that second wave of COVID. Also, there's a, an awful lot of self-employed people who fell, fell between the cracks of the system, you know. And also, the level of sick pay isn't high enough to support people who, who need to self-isolate. So there are those um, errors of policy. So the Bank of England controls the monetary side and the government controls the fiscal side, but is the bank really independent? In one sense, no. The bank's target of 2% inflation is set by the government. And there is a case for the government to change that target, either by raising the inflation target or by asking the bank to target something else, such as total money GDP growth. And I'm surprised that there isn't uh, the debate about that, that, that that perhaps there should be. In that sense, the Bank of England is emphatically not independent. In terms of setting interest rates from, from day to day, I've no reason to think that it isn't independent. 
you know i i think i think there's too much conspiracy theorizing and by but by all means you could argue that the bank of england is not independent by virtue of containing people with similar training and and upbringing and backgrounds from, from the treasury but that's true of true of us all yeah sorry I, that that's very interesting i pulled you off on a bit of a tangent from asset yeah. prices <laughs> Lots of people say the best companies are in the US and that UK investors tend to have too much of a home bias with the growth being in the US. But conversely, US valuations are, are at about their highest point in history. Are you worried about a reversal in the US stock market? It, it could happen, but there's something really, really good about overvaluations. And that is that when they get corrected, they get corrected slowly. So take, for example, the tech bubble of 1999. Shares we know now were obviously overvalued then, but it took three years for the bubble to deflate. Overvaluations are corrected slowly. And for investors, that's great because it means that there's a, we can follow a rule uh, to combat this. And that is the, the rule to sell when prices fall below their 10 month moving average, because that, of course, it doesn't get you out at the top of the market, but it gets you out after the market is slightly deflated and it will get you out for a, a long period uh, of further um, valuation declines, you know, should, should we see them. And it also has the virtue of keeping you in the market as, as long as overvalued markets get, get it e even more overvalued. So, so the answer is that we, we've got, a rule to combat this problem so, and I, I would advise everyone to keep, keep a, a firm eye on that rule. Yes you write about that a lot I was, I was going to ask you about it I guess last year is the one exception to a to a slow market sell-off. Um, yeah but but, it, but but even even there the, the 10 month rule wasn't wasn't catastrophic yeah I mean the 10 month rule doesn't work perfectly it doesn't get you out at the top it doesn't get you in at the bottom but it does protect you from the sort of long and deep bear markets of the sort that really destroy your wealth you know it worked beautifully um during, during the tech bubble and bust and it worked very well in getting you out of um the market in anticipation of the financial crisis uh, to uh, 2008 you know it's it works when you most need an investment strategy to work. And that's something that's really useful. Yeah, thank you. That's that's very helpful. I think market timing generally is an interesting one because the general advice that you hear is don't try and time the market. It's too difficult. But it does, you know, you just see how many fund managers started buying in the sell-off last year. It does seem that opportunistic investing is what active fund managers do, at least. Warren Buffett would be an example. Apart from the 10 month moving average, are there any other metrics that people might look out for? Yeah, there's loads. Just... I have never understood this idea that market timing doesn't work. You could equally argue that market timing works and that stock picking doesn't. We've got lots of lead indicators of returns. We've got the dividend yield. Are, are, are on, on the all share index, that is a fantastic predictor uh, of medium term returns. You know, the, the longer the time horizon, the better the dividend yield predicts. We've got things like the ratio of global share prices to the global money stock, uh, the ratio of retail sales to the all share index. When retail sales are high relative to the all share index, the market sub 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 subsequently rises, uh, plus the, the 10 month rule. We've got lots of lead indicators that tell us that you can time the market. Now, the caveat there is that you can't time it from day to day or week to week or month to month. Over the short term, there's so much noise that, that you can't time the market. What you can do, though, insofar as history's only guide, is to use these sort of lead indicators to, to tell us whether we should be in the market and to what extent over a 12 month or two year or three year time horizon the longer the time horizon the more predictable 
uh, equity returns have been. What about macroeconomic indicators, the types of things we were talking about earlier? I think a lot of fund managers would say that they don't really look at them because you can't predict them and they focus on what they can measure. If you, uh, as a long-term investor, would you recommend taking a similar approach? Yes, to be honest. Macroeconomic forecasting um, isn't really very good. And it, it, it's got one massive problem, and that is that economists can't predict recessions. There's a chap called Prakash Langani at the IMF who has compared private sector forecasts for, of economic activity to, to outturns. And he show, he's shown that they have failed to predict recessions pretty much forever. Now, the 2020 recession was genuinely unpredictable anyway. You know, you, you, you can give macroeconomics, uh, uh, you know, a, a pass there. But they failed to predict the 2009 recession. They failed to predict the, the recessions of, t- of 2000 in the US. They failed to predict the recessions of the early 90s. The, the, the record of failure to predict recession is pretty much perfect. The one indicator I would urge everybody to look at, however, is quite simply the shape of the yield curve. When long data yields are above short term rates, it's an indicator that there's low probability of recession and therefore an indicator that equities will do well. And when 10-year yields are below short-term rates when the yield curve is inverted. That's a sign of a high probability of recession and a warning to get out of equities. That is the one macroeconomic indicator that investors must really, really watch because that's the one that's got information value. Should you be watching the UK or the US? The, the, The two yield curves are pretty highly correlated. So, so the, 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 the so the answer the answer is both. The, U, the U.S. yield curve has done a, a wonderful job of, of predicting the likelihood of recession um, ever since well, oh, since since about the seventies at least. But where is it now? Oh, it, it it's it's nicely upward sloping. The, it's it's telling us that things things are looking all right. And lots of people claim that the UK stock market is undervalued. Um, the interest of private equity companies might support that, but it's also dominated by several big old companies. So the market as a whole is a bit distorted. Do you think UK equities represent good value re- relative to other markets at the moment? Oh, for sure. The UK market is cheap relative to the rest of the world. Yes, but it was cheap last year, the year before, the year before that, the year before that. The year before that, the year before that, and such such cheapness hasn't done us any good. You know, I think as as you say, it's because the market is dominated by some big old companies that are ex growth. Yeah. And in fact, I I would suggest that on the on the measure that matters, the measure that's got predictive power for future returns, the market is actually overvalued because the, the dividend yield is below its long term average. What are your thoughts on European equities? I don't have any. <laughs> well, can I ask you about the euro then? So throughout the crisis and, and previous crises, the ECB has held things together, as I understand it, effectively by the northern members bailing out the southern members. Do you think this is can go on indefinitely? Well, I think a lot of people would question that the North has bailed out the South. I think they'd rather say that what the North has done is bail out the banks that have linked to the South. Yeah, there, there are there are those structural problems for sure, and I think most economists would say that a monetary union to be to be optimum requires greater fiscal transfers, just as we see. You know, in well, in monetary unions like the UK. So, in that sense, the euro isn't a perfect monetary union, but there are very few institutions that are perfect. Now, the question is whether the euro is a feasible monetary union. And so far, people who have bet against that proposition have been wrong. 
So I, I, I would suggest that we shouldn't bet against the Eurozone uh, as heavily as some people would like to. And I think you always have to be incredibly careful as investors not to engage in, in motivated reasoning just because something is consistent with your political beliefs doesn't mean that it's likely to happen. You've got to leave your politics at the door. You comment on our weekly portfolio clinic submissions. What what do you think are the most common issues that you come across? Well, there's quite a, there's quite a large variety. One which I see that I I, w- I would have been surprised at this when I, when I started is the tendency for investors to be over diversified. You know, they they own 30, 40 or sometimes more equities and funds. The upshot of which is that they've got something like a tracker fund, you know, except that they've acquired it at enormous cost of time and dealing costs. And if they're including some actively managed funds in that, then then they've they've got unnecessary ongoing management charges uh, as well. Um, I think what that suggests is that a lot of investors don't devote as much attention to selling as they should. You know, you need to have a selling strategy as well as a buying strategy. Well, that plays deep into human psyche, doesn't it? It's much psychologically easier to buy than to sell. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. I think people underestimate um, what investing is, is about. And Warren Buffett said that investing isn't about being smart. It's about having discipline. You know, and he, he you know, it's not for me to tell that, that he was right, but he was right. You know, and you need the discipline to, to recognise when you're wrong and to recognise that sometimes you've got to sell. And in terms of asset allocation, the old rule of thumb was 60-40 equity, 60% in equities, 40% in bonds. But bond prices are, are high very high relative to history what what are you what are your thoughts on what bond allocation in a portfolio might be for someone medium risk well what matters isn't bonds but but safe assets now personally i'm happier with cash than bond for for the simple reason that the worst case scenario for cash is the level of real interest rates The worst case scenario for bonds is that they could sell off quite badly. If we do see um, short term rates rise faster than I expect, you know, and and I I might well be wrong, then you could see quite a severe sell off in bonds, but you won't see such big losses on cash. The worst thing that can happen for cash is that inflation takes off and interest rates stay low. But that's going to be pretty terrible for bonds as well. But yeah. it, you, you can quite easily see bonds losing you a lot and cash not. And that leads me to suspect that you might as well have a lot of cash as a lot of bonds. You know, what, what bonds do is protect us from the risk of recession. But the shape of the yield curve suggests that risk at the moment is, is, is quite low. You know, sure, there's a risk of a bit of disappointment with economic growth. You know, and bonds will do well there, but you're paying an awful lot to get that insurance. Do you think that alternative assets, private equity and infrastructure trusts, yeah. represent good value and should be part of an investment portfolio? For private equity, absolutely yes. The reason I say that is that Corporate growth is quite likely to come from outside quoted firms. Quoted for a lot of UK listed firms are mature and ex growth. And it's often the case that the best growth happens before a firm gets listed on the stock market. And when the moment is listed on the stock market, it's because its owners want to cash out. And quite why that's a reason for anybody else to want to buy it has always eluded me. So, yeah, private equity, I think, is is, is vital. The difficulty with private equity is that returns on private equity funds can vary a lot from fund manager to fund manager, you know, because it's the nature of the beast that you can see a lot of losses 
on unquoted poems that are compensated by one or two stellar wins. And if you've got one more stellar win than the next guy, and one more loss than the next guy, then your performance looks awful relative to him. So in the case of private equity, you've got a lot more fund manager risk than you have with, with listed equity funds. And that argues, I think, for a little bit of diversification across fund managers. But, but certainly, um, I think all, e equity investors should definitely consider private equity. Great. And infrastructure? I, I'm not so sure about infrastructure. I think I think there's 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 various political risks there, and the alleged defensiveness of infrastructure funds can be acquired through ordinary equities. We know that defensive equities outperform over the long run. We know that there are very strong reasons why that might be the case. You know, so I don't see infrastructure as adding as much to your portfolio as, as, as private equity or, or particular classes of equity. Yeah, I should probably clarify people, I think, would specifically be buying infrastructure for the yield rather than expecting any growth. Buying for yield is incredibly dangerous. Um, well, income comes at a price. Buying for yield means either you're taking on extra risk because the yield is compensating for your risk, or it means you're sacrificing growth because the yield is compensating you for, for growth. I could easily sell you an asset on, on a 50% yield. You give me your money, I'll give you 50% next year, 50% the year after, and nothing at the end. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so, you know, you should not focus on yield. What matters is total return. Well, Chris, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. I'm afraid no, I'm afraid we're out of time. We're really lucky to have you. I wish we could go no, on. But no. Maybe we can do a part two one day on um <laughs> on on asset prices and, and asset allocation. Thank you for your time. Thank you.